Hi, Neil Gittleman here, Artistic Director and Conductor of your Dayton Philharmonic Orchestra. And welcome to this bonus content around our August 22nd rebroadcast of a 2011 production of Leonard Bernstein's Mass, which was a co-production and a collaboration between the Dayton Philharmonic and the Music, Theater, and Dance Departments of Wright State University. Um, I first came across Leonard Bernstein's Mass, and here's my, my well-worn piano vocal score and uh, my, the first part of my orchestra score that I used back in 2011. I first experienced Leonard Bernstein's Mass in 1973 when I was a freshman at Yale, playing in the Yale Symphony, and the Yale Symphony presented the second ever production of Bernstein's Mass. I was a Bernstein fan, and I will confess to you, uh, the first rehearsal, I was a little dubious about this thing. But by the time we got to the performances, I was all in, and Mass has remained one of my favorite pieces. I think in some ways it is Bernstein's greatest. It's all over the place. It's a little like a Spike Lee film. It's got so much going on. You could nitpick it all you want, but the overall effect of this piece is, I think, just amazing, like a Spike Lee film. In conjunction with this rebroadcast on the radio stations of Discover Classical, WDPR in Dayton, WDPG in Greenville, WUSO in Springfield, and also streaming uh, through the Discover Classical uh, website, uh, discoverclassical.org, and the Discover Classical app. Um, for this, I wanted to sit down with John Maucheri, who was the conductor of the Yale Symphony production that I played in the orchestra for all those years ago. John knows an incredible amount about this incredible piece, but he's also, in addition to being a great musician and a wonderful conductor and an excellent writer, he's one of the most interesting people I know. And as you'll hear, we had a far-ranging and I think fascinating discussion about this piece, about Leonard Bernstein, and about all kinds of things. So I hope you enjoy this discussion between John Malcheri and me about Leonard Bernstein's Mass. It's wonderful to speak to you again and to speak about something which is very near and dear to both of us, namely Leonard Bernstein's Mass, a piece which I first experienced under your baton as a violinist in the Yale Symphony. Uh, with two really memorable performances, one in New Haven and one then in Vienna when the Yale production flew magically uh, to Vienna to do the European premiere. And I thought it would be a wonderful opportunity to, to pick your brain a little bit about Leonard Bernstein's Mass because I suspect there's nobody who knows this piece quite as well as you do. Well, I don't, yes, so I suspect you might be right, but I certainly, even if that's not the case, I certainly know it in a way that nobody else knows it. And it's simply that I met Leonard Bernstein in 1971 at Tanglewood, and he hadn't finished it yet. I was the conducting fellow. And then the next year, when there was the revival of that production, because most people don't realize that it only performed a few times at the Kennedy Center Opera House, before it actually opened. So it was, it was, there were like three or four performances. I did not see them. But one year later, Roger Stevens, who was the chairman of the board there, and Sal Hurok, the great entrepreneur, um, decided to make a, a tour of, of the East Coast. But that really meant the Kennedy Center, Philadelphia, the Opera House, and the Metropolitan Opera House. At that time, Neil, uh, the auditions for the street band, the band, uh, included some members of the Yale Symphony. And I had learned about that. So I asked a trombone player whether I could have permission, he would ask if I could have permission to attend rehearsals in New York. Now Mass was not conducted by Leonard Bernstein for its premiere or for that tour. Lenny recorded it one night for Columbia Records, which was the first and only time he ever conducted it. Most people don't realize that. So uh, Maurice Perez was the music director. So our trombonist asked Maurice if, if 
The music director of the Yale Symphony would come to rehearsals and Maurice said yes. I show up, you know, take the train down and I meet him, I shake his hand and he says, okay, can you get me a cup of coffee? So he was obviously <laughs> treating me in a special way and he referred to me as Johnny Italian, which was really particularly uh, sweet. What can I say? It was yeah, a, a, that's great. That should be on your license plate. <laughs> yeah, well, you see, my last name, Mount Cherry, is an anagram of Maurice, which is part of how Lenny remembered my name, you know, at Tanglewood. Okay, so it all goes back. Anyway, long short of it, Lenny was nowhere to be seen for those rehearsals in New York. It was the original cast. And then everybody went down to Washington to prepare for the re-premiere of it at the Kennedy Center Opera House. Now, again, to save money, in that, that was the exact same physical production. Everything was as it was, except that half the chorus were uh, just uh, supernumeraries. They couldn't afford the entire chorus. So they had a really small chorus that was amplified in mic. Anyway, long and short of it was that experience. And I remember calling Betty, my wife, and saying, I get the feeling they don't want Leonard Bernstein around. Indeed, they didn't because, you know, he was a Budinsky. I mean, he wrote it. So and who wants him around? And one day he showed up. And it was the day of the first and only public run through, the public performance before its re-premiere. And I saw Lenny and he... Um, I ran into him backstage and he said, oh, you know, I said, hello, Mr. Bernstein, John Masseri. That's how I pronounced my name. And I said, he said, oh, I didn't know you were working on this, he said. Now, here's one of those advantage moments. I was never a good enough keyboard player to be what people generally look on as the assistant conductor. The assistant conductor, Tom Pearson, was playing keyboard in the pit. So there was really de facto no assistant conductor because the guy was playing, right? You can't right. take he, notes. He couldn't take notes from Lenny, right. So. Uh, Maurice was really happy to have me take notes for him. Then Lenny showed up, and I and I uttered the I uttered the question that changed my life. And I didn't plan it. I don't know whether the spirit of Machiavelli was in the air, whether it was my Sicilian background. I don't know. I said, Mr. Bernstein, do you need anyone to take notes for you in tonight's run through? To which Lenny said, What a good idea, Harry. Give John a ticket to sit with me. So I I remember calling Betty. And I was staying in the guest room of, again, one of another student from the Yale Simmons whose parents lived in Washington. Okay, so suddenly I had to go out and buy a yellow pad of paper, and here it is. Oh, wow. It's the That's... yellow pad of paper. With the actual notes. Saturday, oh, yes. And, and each section I wrote in, you know, marker. So a simple song, right. tape, meditation one, meditation two. And so that I could write in the dark. I never right. did this before. And that was very exciting. So uh, it says here, tapes, track one, um, more, more amp and let, oh, more after tape two amp lights. Lenny noticed that one of the amp amplification speaker lights, the red one, was shining in the dark. And he wanted tape on but it. I'd say so that's, the first, that's the first night. Simple song, must not cut off tape before Alan uh, does the guitar. Bass guitar, too loud, louder. Tommy should come up closer for the second phrase. During flute interlude, more relation between Alan and kid with guitar, etc. So this was how it started, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, 18 years I worked with Leonard Bernstein after that. So what happened, Neil, which was, again, unprepared. I'm sitting there in the box with Leonard Bernstein in the dark taking notes. When this public performance, and as you know, it's two hours, right? You're sitting there in the dark. As you, you, you're writing in the dark. There's a meeting, right? And it's Alvin Ailey. I mean, and it's uh, Oliver Smith, and it's Maurice Perez, and it's Leonard Bernstein, and me. To quote a line, you were in the room where it happened. I and I actually was the room because every, Lenny said, "What's the next note, John? What's the next note?" So I was doing pretty well until I got to a meditation where I think the note was too slow, and so I, I had to <laughs> I had to look at Maurice and say, "Um, uh, you thought that it was too slow for Maurice?" 
All right, so that was like being the trader of all time, to the bearer of, of the note to the conductor from the composer, who, as you know, was also <laughs> a conductor. All right, next morning, it's 10 o'clock, a run through with Leonard Bernstein. I, I'm chasing by this. I mean, I, I think this is pretty amazing, right? So I immediately take my position behind Maurice, who's in the pit. Lenny is like in row 14. And he, of course, has no one to take notes for him. Right. So, booming voice, John, I need you. Stay by me. And I thought, okay, you don't ever have to say that again. You never have to utter that line. <laughs> Just say it once. It applies forever. <laughs> <laughs> now, then, suddenly, Maurice said, no, wait a minute. I need John. So now there was a battle over, what's his name? Johnny right. Italian. Right? I mean, really, this is completely crazy. They set up a walkie-talkie system. So, so you I could hear both of them. From both. So I had a second set of... And were you, were you, were you ambidextrous? Could you do left hand and right hand? I was, it was, you know, that thing. And, yeah. you know, but what then happens is that it opens and I and people say thank you and I go back to New Haven, right? I'm writing my dissertation. So, I don't know, a number of weeks later, I, I get this call from Lenny who said, I got my phone number, I guess, through the mass production. And he said, John, it, it's, it's uh, Leon oh, Giovanni. He always called me Giovanni. This is Leonardo. He said, I just found out you weren't paid. And I wanted to call up and thank you. I said, well, to tell you the truth, Mr. Bernstein, I did that for me because I wanted to watch you work. I went, and he said, well, you know, you're welcome to any of my rehearsals at any time, you know. And so that... You know, that's a kind of short version of this story. But yeah, so my next idea what involves you because I thought, well, I really didn't like that first production. And I'll tell you why, because it was so literally Catholic. You know, there was a monstrance, there were capes. The Kennedy Center looked like it was designed to be, you know, a church. And mass, of course, is a metaphor. It's not actually about a church. It's about the rise and fall of a leader. And it uses the mass sections to tell its story, and as you know, tropes from the popular lang musical language for to tell that story. So it's about the rise, fall, and implicit rise of any leader. So it could have been called football. It could have been, you know, could have called coach. It could have been called any president. It could have been called, so. Could have been I called maestro. <laughs> could have been, yeah. Well, yeah. I hope, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that would be a little too close to home. I'm on the way back up. Um, anyway, so I thought, well, why don't we make something more metaphorical? And I asked permission from him. And he gave me personally permission to do the second physical production of Mass, which is what we did at Yale. And I found two design. I found a designer from the School of Drama and a director of the School of Drama and a choreographer. And the idea was to use Woolsey Hall, which if your your listeners don't know, is is basically this gigantic place with an organ. We're looking at an organ, organ pipe. So it already gives the impression of being, you know, a, a cathedral of some kind. Yeah, ceremonial. To be yeah, true. so the idea was to build scaffolding in front of it that you could see through it. You could still see all of that. And you didn't notice scaffolding, but then all these flags and things kept, kept coming up. In those days, there was a, a nun, Sister Carita, who was making all this poster art. God loves, and they were just really wonderful, very kind of pop art ideas. And a bakery in New Haven had just gone bankrupt, and they had all these boxes that they used to, to put bread in when they would deliver it in the morning, and they just sold them to us for like a dollar. So we built everything out of those boxes, and all of the costumes were homemade, as if the people had created this celebrant. And everything about him and Everything he wore was very kind of tie-dyed and of that period. Now, all right, so, we, so Lenny gives us permission to do that. He comes to New Haven, as you remember. We did two performances. And I cast the role of the celebrant with one of the vocal teachers at Yale who had salt and pepper hair. He was, uh, this. therefore, he was 40-something. He was like Daniel Barrett. He was like Leonard Bernstein. He was not a 20-year-old cutie pie. And Lenny hated that. I mean, after we did that, he was wonderful. And Kingman Bruce, the president, was there. There was a reception. We, uh, 
all of it was wonderful and very generous of Lenny. I mean, after all, but then the press had said, we want to do this in Vienna. And they couldn't make a deal in Europe because it was so expensive to do mass. So the idea was floated, why not bring the Yale production? So I had a meeting with Lenny and he said, look, there's some things I really don't like. First of all, it's a celibate. I don't, I don't want it to be someone with salt and pepper. I want it to be someone young. And luckily the understudy, the understudy for, for the celebration originally was the son of the chief music critic of the Washington Post. All right, so now, now we're into uh, nepotism on the highest level because now we, not only did that mean that we were gonna absolutely get a great review in the Washington Post, but the bottom line was that we had someone who was just a wonderful, you know, Michael was just such a wonderful actor. So we started to make some changes. And then I was 27. I want you to, I was the oldest one in that tour that we went on. And, you know, we all had to go to Vienna. The, the design team had to go there and learn how to turn inches into centimeters, you know, adapt the set for the concert house. And then on top of everything else, when you flew, and we got the plane from Pan Am, and I had to raise money for all of that. It's the first time I ever raised money. You know, that really was, everything was new. The beginning of your real life as a conductor when you had to start. Well, um, what you do. And, then, and then the deal was made with the BBC, the ORF, and PBS. So, video so after we did our four performances at the concert house, we videotaped it, um, and it was broadcast around the world. And the irony is that that production, which I have to say I conceived, I mean, the idea of it not being being more metaphorical, right. became, became the point that everybody saw mass. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people saw the counterproduction of mass as if it were mass. But if you look at pictures from the Kennedy Center, you, you'll see something that, you know, looks like, you know, St. Paul's or, you know, St. Peter's. And uh, anyway, that's a long answer to yes, the question. Yes, I do know a lot about it. <laughs> Indeed. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's such an amazing piece. And I think the the thing that strikes me is that I think it survives even, I mean, the music and the, the fundamental drama of it, what you were describing, the interpersonal relationship of the leader versus the, the followers and, and how that dynamic works. I think it can, can overcome almost any kind of production because the, the piece itself is so strong. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the video that was done many years later at the Vatican which is just stripped away of all of the, the rough edges of the piece. Or there was a production a uh, couple of years ago uh, at Cincinnati May Festival, which was musically very good, but every, everyone in the street chorus, they were kind of dressed like they had all been outfitted the same at the Gap. So it was a very, it didn't have the, the grit that your production did and the, and the reality, but the piece still worked. Yeah. It's, like funny, those approaches. Yeah. it's a funny thing about that because by the way, when we were at Yale, we tried, we had to find some people who were not 18 years old. And we found some people in this, in the city of New Haven. We had, so we had some older people in the cast. So right. it actually had that feeling and, and people of color and all kinds of different sizes and shapes of people, though fundamentally it was undergraduates. But remember, it was also designed and costumed and built and, you know, all of that stuff. Uh, I think the other thing that I, oh, and then 10 years after the world premiere. So in 1981, I did it again at the Kennedy Center in an entirely different production with Tom O'Horgan. Um, and it was wonderful. That was broadcast also on television. Um, and Emil Ardolino, the great television director who did Dance in America, operated the cameras. And if anyone can access that, for me, that's that was definitive. And by the way, when that was over, of course, I did go to the Vatican and I was, you know, I was part of the avant-garde there, the vanguard of where to do it. The best idea I think I ever had was I went to Ostia Antica, which is, you know, which is the actual port, the old Roman port. Uh, outside of, of, of Rome, just on, on, the, on the Mediterranean, where there is a partially restored amphitheater. And I thought, wow, why not do mass here and then make styrofoam columns to complete the amphitheater 
while you're watching it and then have it all be torn down. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can do it a million different ways. But I think the, the worst way to do it would be to put it as a kind of a tie-dyed, um, I don't know, affectionate view of, oh, those silly people in the 19, in 1970s who were, you know, the anti-war people, bell bottoms. And you, know, you really want it to feel like it's now. Right. And that, and that was that was a discussion that that we had when we were putting our production together. And, you know, we we briefly talked about that, but everybody decided that we weren't really interested in it being a flashback to the 60s, that it really did have the same the same relevance and the same pointedness now, uh, you know, with. It maybe you know things are different, but you could have you know a, a street chorus. Well, we talked about having a street chorus that was entirely made of homeless people, as a, as one possible metaphor. Uh, and we ended up with a with a mix, but but homelessness was, and that was one of the things that the director did because he wanted he wanted each member of the street chorus to create their own backstory. Yes. Uh, so it really was a, a beautifully put together organic thing of the moment and of the the players who were playing it. Um, so this is a, this is exactly right, I believe. This, I would agree with everything you've just said. Um, and and the other thing too is that in those days, when when I was conducting it first with you in the in the orchestra, the score hadn't been engraved yet, and so what I had. Were, was masked in all kinds of handwritings because Lenny only orchestrated the meditations. He didn't orchestrate everything. He orchestrated some of it. Percy Kay orchestrated some of it. I suspect that Sid Raymond or some other hands. So I, I you know, mass had, was constructed as well as composed. And Simple Song, as Lenny told me, was written for St. Francis, for a movie about St. Francis. And this was the movie that was going to be, he was going to make with Franco Zeffirelli. And so Sing God, a simple song, is actually the words for St. Francis, not for ourselves. Yeah. And so now that it's engraved, it looks like, oh, well, right, you know, it sprung full out of Lenny's head one afternoon. But the grinding work, I mean, you know, the, the Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus was really a happy birthday song to his piano teacher, Helen Coates. Happy, happy birthday, Helen Coates. Happy, happy birthday. So all of that, I, I at least got to conduct it knowing it's, as it were, constituent parts. But there's nothing wrong with now that, you, you know, you approach it as a conductor with your memory of having done it. But now you see it from the beginning to the end. In the same handwriting, the same engraving. Right. Well, I, I remember at, at some point back then we were talking about it, and I remember you saying to me something to the effect that, you know, it's not a mass, it's really a Broadway show. Well, some and, it is. And, and that, when you, when you talk about that construction, you know, that's exactly what happens in the Broadway show. You assemble pieces and the composer ends up not doing the orchestration because there's there's so much time pressure and you know nobody can do everything. Um, well, so it's it is, you, it is interesting that way. But you also see how, how he got stuck. So that's why he had to call in um, he had to call in Stephen Schwartz to help with lyrics. Um, you know he was not collaborating with anybody, which is a very different experience. Remember he had all kinds of writers block after West Side Story. Well, because he was Wouldn't. learning. Well, not only that, he was also music director of the New York Philharmonic and had to learn all that music. Right. I mean, he suddenly, every concert must have included at least one or two pieces he had never conducted before. And he was doing that for years. So, of course, he said goodbye to Broadway and to composing. Um, but so when I met Stephen Schwartz, you know, Stephen Schwartz now, because of Wicked, everybody knows who Stephen Schwartz is. In those days, he was a young guy with a rhyming dictionary. You know, so local vocal yokels. I mean, Lenny really didn't want multiple internal rhymes. He really hated them. Uh, <clears throat> now, the other thing, too, is that if you, I, I have no idea of the impact of all the people who did it with you and Dayton. But if you remember at Yale, the impact on the people who performed it, and most stories you hear from people, universities, places that do it, has to do with what the transformative effect of just simply performing it brings yeah. up. 
We absolutely say, had the same thing. Say, yeah, you may say, oh, it's this, it's that, it's not enough of this, it's too much that. The fact is that the people who do it are transformed by the piece, which it absolutely is, change, changes their lives, personally yeah. and professionally in some cases. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that extraordinary that it has that impact? Now, well, the other, and then there's the story of Bob Picardo. Well, of course, he <laughs> lost his hair. He lost his hair, but he, he got a career. Well, I'll tell you the other thing about Bob Picardo. He couldn't really sing God Said and, um, because it was too high. And so uh, right here, it, uh, here's God Said transposed down for Bob Picardo. And I, uh, I wrote the transition. I wrote a little transition that Lenny... Just so, oh, fine, that's good. Oh, I did, he I didn't even notice it. We had to use, use a tritone transition just because I thought this guy is so great as the alternative celebrant. Now, mind you, now, we, we, I, I, we should back up though because because some of the people who are who are taking this in may not know who we're talking about. Okay. So the so Bob Picardo, the the student. I'll, I'll tell the brief version of the story as I understand it, and then you can correct me. But there was this great, this great student who sang the, the, the gospel sermon, big, what I would call a Jufro, uh, and just absolutely fabulous, tore up the scenery, practically brought down the house. Um, and the way I heard the story is he was, he was pre-med and was supposed to, supposed to be a doctor, and that Lenny basically, after the performance, talked his parents into letting him be an actor, which is what he really wanted to be. And then he ended up as as the doctor on Star Trek Voyager without his true for anymore. Yeah, well, is that true. essentially true? That is, the truth. that is the truthiness. There's lots of truthiness in that story. <laughs> but I, I have to tell you, because he was so good, I just decided, oh, look, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to transpose it. Right. Because you, you can da, 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 da. You know, that, that's the part where you can't. You know, Lenny, again, it's like I go on. You know, Lenny was always writing for this imaginary baritone, right? Tony in West Side Story, the celebrant, you know, he, he right, the, it's tessitura, the, same. the tessitura suddenly goes here, and wait a minute, that baritone can't sing that, right? Uh, you have to have this rather freaky voice. And I remember when I was a kid, reading Life magazine about Lenny trying to get Larry Kirk to, to sing the role of, of Tony. Well, when I saw West Side Story, I was 10 years old. Larry was still having trouble with something coming, and Maria, because, you know, there's the, the, he had the, the high B-flat or something he never could have done. So similarly, and I go on, which is high, um, we did do it in in the right in the original key uh, and i'm sure you did too uh but i have done it at whole tone lower it's not hard again to do that and lenny didn't mind I mean, that was the thing about lenny he was so generous um you know he let me do stuff he almost never said that's too slow as <laughs> <laughs> which is why which is why that must have hurt maurice very much to have that to his I, had no context for that except that I was trapped in the, the office of Roger L. Stevens with all of these amazingly famous people, and I was providing notes. Um, no, I mean, that, for example, in the Lauda, I, I mean, I conducted that in five and not in uh, uneven two. Da, da, di, da, da, you know, and because I wanted it to have a kind of a gravitas, like the bells, these huge bells. Right, yeah. And also, if you remember, I had the big chorus go out into oh, the audience. Right. right. So when it finally pa cha pa cha all the pe only people on the stage were the street chorus, and you didn't notice that the ecclesiastical ecclesiastic chorus was gone. And then so when the final chorale happened, suddenly everybody in the audience heard it as if they were singing it. Right. Um, and that was a very big. You know, that was an idea I had, and it's, it, it worked wonderfully. And I occasionally use that concept, in, and sometimes if I'm allowed to have that kind of experience in, in concerts. I did that with Gus Rheingold, and we put the six harps in boxes at the Kennedy Center. So as the, as the, ent the gods entered Valhalla, the cannon was heard moving around the room by having a harp in each of the boxes. So that kind of thing. I did that also with the Trojans, so the final Trojan march was from the house as 
as you know, the vision of, of Rome conquering the world and, and the destruction of the churches. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. So the other, what did you find now approaching this as a conductor, the various, as it were, styles? Did, it, did they seem less disparate or did it seem all of a piece to you? You know, that's interesting. I think from my experience, I just, you know, I'm, I'm an eclectic listener myself. So the notion of having rock and blues and jazz and everything mixed up makes perfect sense to me. I think it, it was a little bit of a stretch in some cases for the musicians just to kind of get into the style. Um, but I think, you know, it's, I think the biggest difference perhaps between the early 1970s and our current day is that there is so much more music around us. And what we hear is so much more eclectic and people listen to all kinds of things. And I think the, the strong reaction that some people had back in, in when the piece was written to, you know, what the hell is this rock music doing in this thing called mass? I, I, I don't think it matters that much to us anymore. And I think all those kind of insecurities of the style just have fallen away. Good. I would I would say so, but and I also think you have you know you have two ways to view it. Yes, you have to conduct it like it's a single piece because that's what it is now. You also have to somehow help the audience understand that the people's response to the Latin text is also a shock. Yeah. You know, it's what, what tropes were in, in the Middle Ages. I mean, these were this was new music to confront Gregorian chant. It was not. So in one, one sense, it pays homage to a history of Western music um, and the drama of the church. But also, it's a single piece. And you have to look at it that way. Right. The idea of fraction, um, to quote everything that happened up until that point, is a kind of stream of consciousness, is a brilliant way of summarizing for the audience everything they've heard up to this point. Okay, so you mentioned Stephen Schwartz earlier, and you mentioned Fraction, which is kind of the, the celebrant's mad scene at the end. Um, did I ever tell you the story that Stephen Schwartz told me about that? No. I guess not. So Stephen um, has a, a relationship um, with our local repertory theater company, and I think there's a scholarship endowed in his name. Um, and there was an event that happened here. He was in for something. Uh, I, I think the, the company was doing a, a show of his, uh, not one of the big ones, one that was kind of assembled from lots of different material. And so I, I met him at this reception. And I think it was, it was maybe a year or two after we had done mass here in Dayton. So we're, we're sitting by this table of hors d'oeuvres and things talking and he what he said to me is you know that scene at the end Bernstein asked him to sort of take a lot of different elements and lines from different parts of the piece and sort of assemble them so that he could take things and what Stephen told me was he did that literally. He just sort of wrote this stream of consciousness thing, this big list of things, and imagined that Lenny would then take whatever he wanted. And he said, Lenny started at the beginning and set the thing that he'd written down word for word, um, which was not what he intended, but it turned out to be just the absolutely perfect thing. Well, one, that says a lot about the talent genius of Stevie Schwartz because he right. was called Stevie. We called him Stevie, right? Uh, uh, Stephen Schwartz. Stevie and Johnny Ital Italian. <laughs> and Johnny Italian. Uh, and, and, but also, Lenny knew a good idea when he yeah. had that. I, he, you know, that was the thing. He was really a generous human being, Leonard Bernstein was. Listen, I, when, when uh, the world premiere of A Quiet Place, which was a sequel to Trouble in Tahiti, happened at uh, Houston, and it was not a success. And I was scheduled to conduct it at the Kennedy Center, and no one knew who was gonna conduct it at La Scala. 
And I, it was heartbreaking to see what happened that night. The first scene of the new opera was as long as all of Trouble in Tahiti, and it was like being dropped into a mixture of Wozzeck and Elektra. After you've had this really charming, funny, and touching Broadway-style opera. And so I, I came back here to New York, and I started looking at the timings, and I realized that in the middle of the new opera, the big long one, the second scene, that Sam goes to the goes to the drawer by where his his wife has passed away. We've seen her. We've seen the funeral. Uh, he opens the drawer and finds her diary. And I went, oh well, that's the key. Start in the first scene of the new opera. End at the end of that scene with an epilogue. Then the second scene becomes the second act in which he opens the diary and you go back into trouble at the end. So and then the third scene of the new opera becomes Act Three. So. I did the timings. I called Houston because I was back here in New York and Lenny's sister was, I called her first. I called Shirley and I forgot about the time zone change. And of course, Shirley was also a night owl. And I got, and I had, hello. And I said, Shirley, it's John Macheri. Oh, oh, hello, John. And I told her this idea and she said, I may be asleep, but I recognize a good idea when I do it. <laughs> So I think the Bernsteins, just like Lenny, recognized what it is that um, that Steve was doing. But I mean, remember when when I did the, the the meditations for cello and orchestra, the third meditation was only because I did it with you guys um, that I realized that I had written the third meditation. Right. I mean, I had the orchestrations for one and two. I didn't have three, and I went, "Why is that?" I went, "Oh, I remember because I came up with the whole order you, of things. you assembled it right." Then and, and then, then and then Lenny conducted it. That, so being you know imprimatur, uh, we had it. So you know, but that's that's kind of uh, the honor to have worked with him. I have to say, because you know he was generous, and if he thought you were doing something wrong, he'd tell you. And so, you know the the other thing, the other thing about that fraction scene and the all the the flashbacks and references, I have no idea if you know because great ideas sometimes pop up. In, individually in different places. But when I see the very end of Hamilton, the scene, you know, between when the shot happens, and I mean, that's basically a shortened version of what happens to the celebrant with the the reminiscence of lines and references from earlier in the show. And I have no idea if Lin-Manuel ever saw Mass, but it's exactly the same gesture. I'm sure Daddy had the recording because Lin-Manuel grew up with Broadway cast album. Right, that's true, yeah. Also, uh, remember Lucia de Lamamore, the mad scene, there is a quote <clears throat> of the love music uh, when Edgardo was alive. And also, if you consider a whole, the whole concept of the immolation scene and the Siegfried funeral march, Wagner was playing with this idea of memory and, and themes coming back. So you, you have you have a history of that. I mean, Wagner more than anyone you know, unearthed how memory works with music and how we can have a tremendous emotional, the emotional impact of recapitulation. And I don't mean like the whole exposition coming back, but I mean little bits of things of memory. And so we, we have this tremendous sense of empathy at that time has moved by, even though, yeah, it may only be two hours. But it feels like we've gone through a lifetime with these characters. So, yes, if you, I mean, Siegfried Funeral March is the, maybe the single most brilliant use of that before Fraction. There's no words, which makes it even more brilliant. But between each of those, dum dum, dum dum, dum dum, there's a then there's a melody, and we're we're back to Siegfried's parents when they first met, bum bum. And then, oh, and now we're, you know, that, so it keeps going on. And what makes that so astonishing is that it's, it starts, it's based on Hagen, who kills him, right? Hagen, Bastustu, Hagen. And then finally, when it, it goes into the major and you have dun dun, it becomes Siegfried. Right. He comes in the major and you hear Siegfried. So, so again, Lenny, who you know, didn't conduct a lot of Wagner operas, in fact, he conducted excerpts and maybe Act Three of, of Siegfried once and, and excerpts of Tristan. He understood this implicitly how the mind works. But Fraction is 
fraction pulls it all together. Just like Mama Rose, when she does her final mad scene at the end of Gypsy and everything's coming up roses, Mama, you know, again, if you didn't have that last scene, when, I mean, I remember seeing Merman do it, Gypsy would just be a show about vaudeville and a striptease artist, right? But that's what that, transforms it to something. Right. Yeah. And again, mass, all the disparate elements get pulled together in, a, in this stream of consciousness moment. So, it, you know, it's really brilliant. It, 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 it does, in fact, pull it all together, tie it up with a string and hand it to you. And that, that's really kind of uh, his genius, because he could step back from it and say, now, I, I've been writing all these elements over the past 20 years. Right. This is a song for Helen Coates. This is a, somebody I did this for. This is a song for, for St. Francis. What is this thing? You know, it, it, is it just a big hero sandwich with salami and then some prosciutto and then provolone? And, you know, what makes this thing a thing? And he achieved that. And it must be wonderful for you to, to relive being an undergraduate again. I mean, you, you know, you, it encompasses your whole adult life. Doesn't it? Yeah, it, it really was because, you know, when we when we conceived of this thing, we conceived of it from the beginning as a collaboration with with Wright State University, which is a, a local state school, but has a really, really strong theater and musical theater department and sends lots of kids to to what well, what was Broadway before the virus hit us and what will hopefully be Broadway again. Um, and it really was a in a way, I and my collaborators here at Dayton were able to sort of recreate the same magic in a bottle that you and your collaborators in New Haven had done. And I thought I thought it was also, you know, a tribute to the piece that, as you said, there really is something about this piece that, that transforms the the people who do it. And to see that same magic happening decades later with a whole different crop of of young people who grew up in a complete they weren't even born. They weren't even born exactly, and you know came from a completely different um, cultural milieu. And just how the piece is what it is. It is this this amazing force. Yeah, yeah, it's a force for good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, John, thank you. This was this was so much fun. Um, you think you'll ever uh, do another production of Mass, or is it all in your in your rearview mirror? Do you think? You know, I I have I don't I can't answer that question because whenever I say I'm never going to do that again, that's when the phone rings. That's when the little yeah. fairy is over your head and the phone is ringing and it's the Pope or it's I don't know. Um, in fact, it, but but I feel like I've done it. I, I, but I, I would never say no to doing it again. But, but think of this: I, I have broadcasted on television twice, once in seventy and once in eighty-one. So it's there, right? Uh, and again, we are just translators. But that word "just" in that sentence is a powerful word because actually everything we do is translation. Everything. Read a recipe, you translate it. Uh, you're listening to me and you're translating what I'm saying. So the highest art is translation. It is how we communicate. So if there was an opportunity to do it again and it seemed like the right thing to do, of course I would do it. But it's time for others always to do it. That's our point. We don't own anything. You know, I don't own this watch. I, you know, my son will have it someday unless someone steals it. And then that person will own it. So I... I'm I'm honored to have been part of it. And in a funny way, a little piece of what I did was given to you. And then what do you do with it? It's like a starter. It, it's you know, sourdough. It's a starter. And you it's your own bread. And, and there's it, and there's probably someone who is in our production who's exactly. gonna do a production in 20 years when they're the head of a theater company or something. Exactly. As it should be. And remember when Neil what was his name? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah something get. Yeah. Gittleman, that's it. Yeah. It was so great, you know, and that person wants to be a conductor or wants to be a director. And that actually is the, the privilege of doing what we do because it is an unbroken line from 
thousands and thousands of years ago. We as humans invented music. Let's just face it, right? I had to, I had to figure that out when I was writing for the love of music. I mean, what is it about music? So when I wrote that book, I had to go deep inside myself. And why did it attach itself to me at such an early age? Before puberty, before anybody taught me about structural analysis about why a song by Schumann is good, because it had nothing to do with structure. I, what did I know? I just loved it. So why did it attach itself to me? One was part of the story, but the other part of the story is where does it come from? And you know, about a month ago, the New York Times had a Sunday magazine section about the Silk Road, the entire magazine, pictures. I'm reading this and I'm going, wait a minute. The you, Silk you, Road, sorry, the Silk Road, Silk Road, the entity or the Yo-Yo Ma thing or? Entity. Every, okay. entity right. thing. The actual Silk Road. Got the actual it. Silk Road. And so here's the deal about it. It was 4,000 miles long. It existed for 2,000 years. And I started to write about this as a kind of an extra chapter to, for the book that got published before the pandemic. And I started thinking about all the different people who carried the silk from the area where the silkworms lived, all westward, westward, uh, you have Persia, uh, nomadic tribes, it gets to Imperial Rome. The Romans see flags made of silk and they're terrified. They've never seen such a thing. So everybody wants silk. They buy silk. All the way for those 4,000 miles, they're carrying silk, but they're also carrying music, indigenous music. And they're bringing music with them when they get to Rome. Of course, they hear music in Rome, but what is Roman music except Greek music and Egyptian music and music from every place that the empire had conquered, conquered, but the conquest goes back. And so then they take their money, whatever that is, uh, back to where the mulberry trees are and the, and the, the uh, silkworms live, but they're also carrying now music with them too. They're singing and they're dancing. So what we call music is, a, is an international global thing. It's a, something that we humans create. So mass, in a way, is another part of that great musical silk road. And we are carrying, in both cases, we are, you know, we are alternating current. We carry the silk, we hear the music, we carry it back. And that's what we do, and that's nearly what we do. We are just translators. I couldn't think of a better place to, to wrap it up, because that really does, that says it all, both about the peace and also about life and what we do. Why we do it. Exactly. Okay. Lots of love. Thank you the so much, John. Happy best okay. year orchestra. We had a good time together a couple of years ago. It was great. And we'll, maybe we'll do it again when we can okay. do it again. Amen, shalom, and peace. Yes. <laughs>